In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In my study of uh, the book of Hosea, I find some very troubling parallels from those days and the days of the judges and the days that we are in today. There are parallels in there that are not good. Today when you listen, there's calls for impeachment of the leaders. There's calls for open borders so anyone can come in. No border enforcement. Guaranteed rights to abortion for every woman who wants one. And every nationality has a right to American citizenship. Whether they're born here or not, no matter what country they're from. So really, there's no difference today than it was in the days of Israel's apostasy. We are going astray just like Israel did. It is not spelled out specifically in the law. What they're telling you is it will be permitted. If there is nothing that says you can't do it in the law, then you can do it. Regardless of what the sin may be that people are talking about. Let's look at an example of how there's no difference today than there was in the days of old Israel. Look at it, Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in your heart to the Lord. If you look around you, you'll see that almost every religious body today includes instrumental music in their worship. Almost all of them. Of course, we do not. Why? Because it is not actually specifically prohibited in the New Testament. And David did it in the Old Testament. Therefore, we can do it. That's their thinking on this matter. You know, when you're speaking to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, you're doing there what the Lord commanded you to do. You see, the Bible does not say you cannot praise God without a piano leading the song. Therein, it is not prohibited. Or is it? Do you remember this morning's lesson in the Bible class? I asked a question concerning hermeneutics. What were the elements of hermeneutics? And I gave you two. And only one person was brave enough to answer with a third. The Bible gives us examples. The Bible gives us commands. And the Bible gives us inferences. When I look at this particular verse, there is a command speaking to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. That is your command to sing to the Lord. It is not an inference. It is not a guess factor. It's not a prohibition. It is a positive statement of things that you must do. Looking at Colossians 3.16, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I didn't see and a piano on there or any other command other than we are to sing with grace in our hearts unto the Lord. If the word of Christ dwells in us, then we are to teach and admonish one another with our singing. And we are to do so with grace towards each other as we do that. These are direct commands from the Lord for how to worship Him. 
That's exactly what he wants us to do. Can you hear others over the volume of a piano or the organ, or can you recognize the love and grace in their voice towards you when a piano is banging in your ear? You can't do it. This is not a lesson on instrumental music, but it just happens to be an example that we can use for what we're talking about. Is your heart edified by the banging of a piano, the sound of a piano? What kind of learning did you get from that or teaching did it that piano teach you? Nothing. But preacher, it's not specifically prohibited. That's what they want to tell me. It's not specifically prohibited. What about the silence of the scriptures? What about silence? Is it permissible or is it prohibitive if there is silence in the scripture about a subject? The world wants to tell you that it is permissive. What I want to tell you is that it may be prohibitive when it is not mentioned in the scripture. Most tell people will tell you, well, it depends on how you want to interpret the, the scripture. How you feel about your worship and God's acceptance of your worship. Will God accept worship with a piano? He didn't command it, did he? So why the question of permissive or prohibitive when you're looking into the scriptures if only your opinion matters? Why silence is prohibitive is what we want to talk about. Silence is prohibitive because it is common sense. Common sense. You know, it's common sense to quietly approach your enemy when you're going into battle if you're trying to make a sneak attack. You don't want to come in there like a roaring cannon. You want to sneak around and catch him. Silence is not permissive, it is prohibitive in this particular case. Since silence is prohibitive when you're worshiping God, free from persecution, <coughs> the Roman army uh, was persecuting Christians during that time. They had to go underground to worship. They needed silence and silence was prohibitive for them so that they did not come under persecution and attack. These people would kill them if they caught them worshiping the Lord. In the Bible, as well as in the army manual, it does not specifically tell you to remain silent in every specific situation. But common sense tells you there's times to be silent. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Mark 14, verse 22. Was it necessary for Jesus to tell them that he could not use a hamburger on the Lord's table? Was it necessary? Or was it just common sense that you'd use the same unleavened bread that Jesus broke and gave to the disciples and said, here, take and eat. He didn't say you couldn't eat a hamburger, did he? Or a pot roast meal or anything else? No, he didn't. Then he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Mark 14, verse 24. Did he say you could not have a cafe latte piled high with whipped cream and sprinkled with cinnamon to go with that hamburger? No, he didn't prohibit it. He was silent on that matter. But silence is prohibitive because he told you he wanted you to new, use new wine. It does sound good, though, to have a hamburger and a latte before you go to bed or something. Common sense says Jesus intended for us to do what he was doing. What he told his disciples to take and to eat. 
If I ask you to bring me the hammer like I did Jimmy this morning, I didn't have to tell Jimmy, well, Jimmy, I don't want the screwdriver. I don't want the wrench. I don't want the saw. I want a hammer. Wasn't necessary to do that, was it? So silence on those subjects, the screwdriver, the wrench, and the saw, was implied. Impl implication is one of the hermeneutics that we were talking about earlier. Commands, examples, and implications make up hermeneutics. Jimmy understood, and it was implied, that these things were not needed. So why is silence prohibitive? Well, because of common sense. And also because we have commands in the scripture of things that the Lord wants us to do. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 verse 15. John 15 verse 14. You are my friend if you do what I command you. This is Jesus telling us what he wants us to do. He didn't say, do what you want to do if it feels right and good, and I'll make up the difference on the other end. That's not what he said. When someone teaches you you can do what you want to do, they're teaching you an error. Silence is prohibitive because of commands and because of common sense in this world. Look at Deuteronomy 4 verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Moses is telling the Israelites this is the law. You have to follow the law. You can't change it. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. Does that apply to us because that's in the Old Testament? Yes, it does. And we know for a fact that it does. This verse makes it crystal clear that Jesus did not have to tell you that a hamburger on the Lord's Supper is wrong. And a cafe latte, latte is not acceptable in our worship service. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to nor take away from it. Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. Paul said, sing with melody in your heart, so be careful to observe and not add a piano to it, or an organ or any other instrument of worship. He said, sing and make melody in your heart. You know, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Proverbs 30, verses 5, through six, 5 and 6. If the Lord feels that way about it, if you add to or take from his word, he'll call you a liar come judgment day. And who's the second ones in uh, Revelation 21, 8 that's going into hell? First are the cowards and second are the liars in that list of sins that are committed to, to the Hadean realm. Lest he call you a liar. Lest you be found a liar. He allowed David to play instruments in the temple. And people would tell you, oh, but I know that you could use them in the church. I just know you can because David did. The Lord didn't allow that, did he? He said, sing, sing. Ask yourself, where is the authority for instrumental music in worship? Or anything else that you want to add to the word of the Lord, it's not there. If it's not there, you're violating his law. It is prohibited. For I testify, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of prophecy, 
God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. We're studying that book right now, chapter 22, how glorious heaven is going to be. If you want to add to his word and take from his word, you're not going to be there. Because you will be found a liar, and that's the second group in hell. The story goes that uh, they had this instrumental discussion up there in Tennessee. And the preacher, after the arguments were concluded, said, Well, play on, Miss Bertha. They would not listen to the truth, the Word of God. Play on, Miss Bertha. If feeling good now is better than feeling good in eternity, you better do some thinking about it. Because it's really not going to feel good if God finds you to be a liar. Why is silence prohibitive? Common sense. There are times when you need to be quiet. Commands of the scriptures. There are things you are commanded to do. There are also examples of scripture that tell us what to do. Because we have examples, it is prohibited in the scripture. What do we learn from Nadab and Abihu? All of us know about that uh, story in Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it. Well, that's what it was for. And put incense on it. Well, that's what it was for. And offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So the fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2. The Lord told them to use the fire under, under the altar. They took it from somewhere else. Seemed innocent enough. Well, I thought I could do it. Well, I thought I could play the piano. Well, I thought I could do all these other things. I thought I only needed to take to the Lord's Supper one day a month, you know, or maybe twice a year, Christmas and Easter. I thought does not equate to what the scriptures say. Do you remember Uzzah from last week's lesson? We talked about him. Does this in 1 Chronicles 13, verse 10? Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. God gave us a command. He said, do not touch the ark. He didn't say, it's okay if you want to prop it up if it's going to fall to the ground. He didn't say it's okay to catch it if it starts floating down the river. He said, do not touch it. That gave them an exclusion for everything else. You cannot do it. Do not touch it. Is what the Lord told them because of that. Uzzah thought he was doing the right thing. He actually thought if the ark hit the ground, God would be displeased. But it was more displeasing for him to be disobedient to God than it was for the ark to hit the ground. What about the Judaizers in Israel? Do you remember them? They were always after the Christians. Oh, you can't do it that way. You have to be circumcised or you'll never be saved. That's what they wanted to tell the people. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Acts 15 verse 1. Does that remind you of anything? Oh, you got to have a piano, don't you? It surely does. Oh, I can't sing without a piano. I can't carry a tune. Uh, 
Uh, I get distracted by other people if I can't hear the piano. And sister so-and-so over there, she's got the squeakiest voice I ever heard. There's all kinds of reasons in there. Jesus did not give a command to be circumcised in the New Testament. But the Jews wanted to revert to the customs of Moses, just like congregations want to have musical instruments because David was allowed to do it. Exactly the same thing, isn't it? They want to revert to the old law. Neither of these, circumcision or musical instruments, have a command, an example, or an implication for their use anywhere in the New Testament. If you can find it, we'll start doing it. But it's not there. So silence is prohibited because it's common sense, because of the commands of the scriptures, because of the examples of the scriptures that we have, and God's use of the law of exclusion. Uh, what do you mean there? Well, we find that the word of God, he uses the law of exclusion in a, nearly everything that he does. By telling you what he wants, God excludes everything else regardless of whether you personally want it or how you feel about it. What he wants to know is what do the scriptures say? What did I tell you that I wanted done? Keep my commandments. God's law of exclusion means that you can't change anything else. You know, God tells us of the superiority of his son Jesus. For to which angel did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Hebrews 1 verse 5. Who else did he include? Nobody. He excluded everyone else from being his son. Jesus was his son. The Pope is not his son, neither is Mary his daughter. By this exclusive statement, God eliminates the Pope and all others, even angels, as being superior to Jesus. Jesus is our high priest, and Moses did not speak anything about Jesus being a priest from the tribe of Judah. Does that make him not a priest from the tribe of Judah because Moses didn't say anything about it? That's the Old Testament, isn't it? So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. That's the one who said that, Hebrews 5, verse 5. Notice where the authority came from. But it was he, God, who said to him, Jesus Christ, you are my son. He's the one that made him high priest over all of us. He excluded everyone else from that position. The position of high priest. It's Hebrews 1, 5. In Hebrews 7, verse 14. In Hebrews 5, verse 5. Why is silence prohibitive? Because it is common sense. It is prohibited because of the commands of the scripture. It is prohibited because of its given use in the scripture. And the law of exclusion used by God himself. Excludes everything else. He does not give us permission to do. Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. 2 John verse 9. We always want to offer an invitation 
to anyone who needs to be baptized. If you've heard the word and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you're becoming eligible for that baptism. But you must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead. And you must repent of all the sins that you have committed. And God is faithful. He will forgive you of those past sins when you confess them to him. And then are immersed in water and have those sins washed away in the waters of baptism and live faithful until Christ comes back again. We know that we all err from time to time. There is a second law of pardon which the Lord has in place in Acts 8 verse 22. Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thoughts of your heart may be forgiven you. The opportunity to make the corrections in your life is right now while we stand and sing. There is a great day.